For some, it's home. For some, it's a step towards transformation. For some, it's the beginning of a wonderful journey with like-minded people. Thanks to the teaching and mentoring activities and dynamic incubation center, I am now industry ready. Engineering at NITE includes aeronautical, civil, computer science, electrical and electronics, electronics and communication, information science, mechanical, biotechnology, MTech, MCA, and PhD. NITE also collaborates with reputed universities around the world to give students an international academic exposure. At NITE, the focus on research has not only helped me understand my subjects, but reach for the stars. NITE offers a unique co-op program and exposure to architects, artisans and urban designers. I aspire to be the heart of progress. Chema is listed in the World Directory of Medical Schools. the art of helping people smile. A.B. Shetty Dental College is listed as one of the top dental colleges in the country. Justice K.S. Hegde Charitable Hospital, part of the Nite Group, has 1,000 beds advanced labs and diagnostic centers which attract a good number of patients from across South India. Along with teaching and clinical practices, we offer programs in pharmacy, nursing, physiotherapy, speech and hearing, biomedical sciences and paramedical programs like respiratory therapy technology, operation theater technology, medical imaging technology and medical laboratory technology. I've always been curious about the chemistry of cures. I help in healing. From toddlers to seniors, I care for them all. I believe I can help improve the quality of other people's lives. We are blessed with the ability to speak and hear from birth. Not everyone is as lucky. I want to do my bit to help the less fortunate. I am proud to be able to assist a surgeon in the operation theatre. From simple x-rays to sophisticated MRI and PET scans. My course trains me to assist radiologists and physicians. The training I have received in testing blood, tissues and body fluids assures me a job at any clinical laboratory. I help people enjoy every breath. I believe in the power of research to change the world. Nuxer is a one-of-its-kind teaching and research centre that addresses society's health needs through painstaking research in biomedical sciences, food safety, microbiology and biotechnology. What I learn here and at my internship in the University of Minnesota, USA, I will carry with me and teach my community to live healthy and stay happy. We believe in being our own bosses. The Bloomberg Lab helps students stay up to date with the latest trends in global markets. 
students also have access to Bloomberg Analytics and can, in the course of their learning, develop their own analytics. I cook my own recipe for success. Sarosh Institute of Hotel Administration molds each student to become perfect hospitality professionals. A healthy blend of polish and panache. I speak for the voiceless. This is what I'm taught. And this is what I'll practice. I design my dreams and my goals. I measure success by the trends I inspire. Bachelors in Fashion Technology at NITE offer students state-of-the-art labs and the space to get their creative juices flowing. With the best of infrastructure, an active placement cell and a lively atmosphere, education at NITE helps students grow, breathe and bloom. Graduate into a better future. Graduate with NITE. Welcome to NITE, a place where learning goes way beyond the classroom. Uh, everyone, uh, uh, welcome to the uh, Consortium of Rare Genetic Disorders and uh, Bone Marrow Failure uh, webinar series. Uh, today we have a distinguished speaker from uh, the, the clinical side and uh, Dr. Sunil Bhatt is our guest speaker today. Uh, Dr. Sunil is going to uh, enlighten us on the role of hematopoietic stem cell transfer, uh, transplant in uh, pediatric diseases. Uh, before we uh, request Dr. Sunil uh, to uh, start the presentation, let me welcome our uh, Vice Chancellor of the University, uh, Professor Dr. Satish Kumar Bhandari, uh, who is uh, a very avid researcher by himself, although he is busy with administration, but he makes sure that he takes part in all the research related activities of the university. And uh, he has been a great support for our institute, which is primarily a research center. Um, so I also welcome uh, Dr. Sunil uh, Bhatt, our speaker from the Majinda Shah, Kiran Majinda Shah Cancer Hospital uh, and um, from the Narayana Hospital Group. Uh, Dr. Sunil is uh, uh, a pediatric uh, surgeon uh, by profession and he is also the uh, head of the pediatric uh, hematology and oncology division. I will introduce Dr. Sunil uh, a bit later, before that, I also welcome yeah. Dr. Aarti Gupta, uh, the co-founder of the consortium, and Dr. Bharti, who is our chief executive uh, of the consortium. Uh, so, uh, before I, I, I request uh, our Vice Chancellor Sir to uh, give his opening remarks, uh, let me introduce our Vice Chancellor Sir to the audience. 
uh, sir is uh, presently holding this uh, position of vice chancellor of the university since 2017 and uh, he was uh, he has been with uh, nit university for a very long time he joined uh, uh, in the year uh, 1999 as a professor of H ENT and then he rose to the uh, position of the dean of the medical college uh, uh, where he served for 5 years and then he moved on to uh, the higher levels of administration at the university uh, he before joining nit he served as uh, an assistant and associate professor at kmc mangalore for about 10 years sir has held a long list of executive and non executive posts um, uh, such as the president of ima of south canara branch president of aoi of karnataka chapter and karavali chapter sir has vastly contributed to research uh, he has uh, received several grants from b b block uh, uh, government of india uh, sir is also instrumental in establishing the uh, angular laryngectomy club uh, at uh, the uh, kesak the medical academy and uh, which is registered under the international laryngectomy association in india uh, he is recipient of several awards uh, most important being the the prestigious arya bhatta award uh, for excellence in the field of medicine uh, in the year 2006 distinguished uh, alumni award from manipal uh, and eminent educationalist award from uh, the national and international compendium new delhi uh, he also received samaj ratna award in medicine by dhyanam mandira and uh, sanskriti trust bangalore in 2014 and in 2015 he was bestowed the achievement award by mantra natya kala academy mangalore uh, uh, by gurukul utsav uh, sir has also received his frcs from uh, the royal college of surgeons of england in 2018 he was a mm-hmm. fellow of the international institute of organizational psychological medicine in 2018 uh, sir has been awarded the lifetime achievement award Uh, by the association of otolaryngologists uh, of india karnataka and kodagu branch uh, in september 2019 sir has uh, several publications over 72 publications in several prestigious journals uh, in india and abroad he has also attended several conferences and uh, uh, scientific meetings all over the world uh, he has uh, recently been granted a patent on uh, uh, managing uh, 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 on on a uh, development of a mouthwash for managing radiation induced oral uh, mucositis in patients with uh, head and neck cancer which uh, was granted in 2020 sir has also authored two books uh, on one on medicinal both on medicinal plants and uh, he has been instrumental in setting up a medicinal garden in the medical college of our university so with this brief introduction about our vice chancellor of the university i request uh, sir to give his opening remarks over to you sir uh, thank you for uh, uh, the introduction dr anil ban uh, distinguished uh, and dynamic uh, guest speaker for the day dr sunil bhat the director of uh, pediatric hematology oncology of shah cancer center narana health city bangalore and uh, the co coordinator of our of uh, this program as well as uh, um, the co founder of our uh, bone marrow consortium dr arthi khanna gupta and the moderator for this function this webinar dr anirban chakrabarti and uh, my colleagues from nite deep to university and uh, the participants in this very relevant important uh, webinar conducted by the university nuksar our uh, um, that's a, a separate uh, biomedical science institute with research uh, trust uh, i congratulate uh, the uh, our institution nuksar for organizing this uh, webinar um, uh, as you all know we are uh, having uh, this department of uh, nuksar which is uh, the in the fr- front line of uh, this research and uh, uh, imparting biomedical science courses in the university to be connected to the world of science is always uh, fascinating and it is committed to not only doing good science but also to providing opportunities to her staff and students to know about happenings in the world of science particularly in the field of uh, health science 
I'm pleased to be part of this webinar today. I, it's conducted by Nuxar, as I said in the beginning, under the seminar series of the Consortium of uh, Rare Genetic and Bone Marrow Disorders, NITE Deemed University. Over the last five years, NITE has made uh, conscious efforts in promoting research culture at the university and one of the successful outcomes of these uh, effects is the establishment of uh, NITE University Center for Science and Education and Research. A state-of-the-art research institute, uh, uh, it was established in the university to carry out cutting-edge uh, research in the field of biomedicine in collaboration with the clinicians and research faculty of the constant colleges of the university. The large number of external research projects that the, our NUXA faculty has managed to bring in, the foreign collaboration that the faculty of NUXA have initiated, the quality of research that the institute is doing, the kind of research publication that are coming out of this uh, center, and the commitment and the dedication to do better in the years to come are a testament of uh, the fact that the NUXA is performing exceedingly well. In order to support the research and zeal and the enthusiasm of the faculty of NUXA, the Consortium of Rare Genetic and Bone Marrow Disorders was established with the seed grant from the university to Dr. Nani Anirban, who is the director of the institute under the policy of promotion of research from the university. I am pleased to know that uh, Dr. Anirban Jakravarti, who has co-founded this consortium, with Dr. Arati Kanna Gupta is committed towards bringing meaningful and impactful outcomes from the activities of the consortium. Recently, Dr. Anirban has shared the update on the activities of his consortium. I'm extremely happy to note that uh, the consortium has already embarked on a number of research projects aimed at uh, delineating the genetic spectrum of rare mandibulofacial dysostosis, orthopedic syndromes, and uh, even rare bone marrow conditions in our population. Conducting webinars on relevant topics is also one of the activities of this consortium. Today we have a distinguished uh, clinician, uh, pediatric surgeon, I understand, Dr. Sunil Butt, the director of pediatric hematology, oncology, and bone marrow transplantation program at uh, Narayana Health Network Hospitals, Bangalore, he was a guest speaker. I am sure that the coordinators, coordinator will introduce Dr. Sunil uh, Butt to the audience in greater detail. Thank you Sunil for accepting our invitation to be part of this program. The topic that the Sunil is going to cover today is a very relevant one, as Anirban said, particularly to our to Indian scenario. As you know, hemopoietic stem cell transplant involves the intravenous infusion of uh, hemopoietic stem cells in order to re-establish uh, blood cell production in patients uh, whose bone marrow or image, uh, its immune system is damaged or defective. The, over the past uh, half century, this technique has been used with increasing frequency to treat uh, numerous malignant and even non-malignant uh, uh, conditions. It is perhaps the most successful form of stem cell therapy that we talk about today. However, there are a lot of challenges associated with the uh, transplant program, particularly uh, the failure rate, infection, and uh, associated with uh, this condition, your mortality. I am uh, told that uh, the talk will be focused on pediatric genetic disease and the role of uh, uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplant in treating this disease. Post-transplant uh, survival in patients has continuously improved, I understand, over, the over time from combination of uh, refined approaches to patients in uh, patient selection, conditioning, and improved supportive care. I understand uh, the five-year survival rate after a matched sibling donor transplant for pediatric acute lymphoblastic leukemia is uh, now at, to the tune of 70 percent is really remarkable achievement despite all this all the challenges the pediatric uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplant uh, the future is very bright 
as increasing numbers of children benefit from this uh, therapy each year achieving cure and uh, survival rate also is uh, it has improved uh, dramatically as i said uh, earlier the research is also going on in this area uh, uh, for less toxic alternatives for uh, hemopoietic stem cell uh, transplant i understand with advances in particularly in the conditioning regimens novel graft manipulation uh, techniques such as selective t cell depletion early screening and interventions so and so forth this is what is un understand uh, from uh, uh, dr anirban i am sure our learned speaker dr sunil bhatt uh, who has years of experience in bone marrow transplantation in children will give good overview on the topic from our uh, indian perspective i believe the topic is very very relevant for the post graduate students and phd students research scholars scientists and clinicians but it, and it will be really uh, extra, uh, it will be enriching one and uh, it will be carrying very rich memory of uh, memories of this uh, particular webinar on behalf of the university i extend a very warm welcome to dr sunil and also congratulate uh, nitta university center for science and education and also our bone marrow uh, rat bone marrow disorders consortium for organizing this uh, webinar uh, on a very relevant topic a very emerging topic also in biomedical science i wish you all the best may god bless you thank you very much sir for your encouraging words and um, for the opening remarks uh, for uh, the participants uh so now uh, i would like to request our guest speaker dr sunil bhatt to uh, give us a uh, talk uh, but it is customary to uh, to introduce our guest speaker to the audience so may i have the pleasure of doing that of course uh, dr arthi was supposed to do it but um, maybe the internet connectivity is not so great at her end um, she is actually in the us right now and it is early morning for her but still she managed to come online thank you arthi for that um, Uh, so let me quickly introduce Dr. Sunil Bhatt. Dr. Sunil Bhatt is an MBBS MD in pediatrics, uh, and he also has a fellowship from pediatric hematology, oncology, and BMT from SGRH Delhi, uh, and a fellowship on pediatric oncology from Sydney, Australia, and advanced fellowship on blood and marrow transplantation from Sydney. Uh, currently, he is the director and head of pediatric hematology, oncology, and uh, blood and marrow transplantation uh, unit. at uh, narayana health network hospitals he is also working with srcc narayana ridala children's hospital mumbai india and uh, majumdar shah cancer center at uh, narayana health city bangalore he is the honorary secretary of the pediatric hematology and oncology chapter of uh, indian association of pediatrics uh, secretary of karnataka pediatric hematology and oncology society ex chairperson of the stem cell transplant group of pho uh, chapter of iap and uh, editor of international journal of pediatrics and oncology uh, he has received several awards in his uh, illustrious career uh, in 2019 he was awarded the shining star award by the times group 2018 he got the leading healthcare professional of the year award at leadership summit uh, 2017 he won the healthcare personality of the year in the international healthcare summit and awards uh, held in 2017 Uh, he was the gold medalist uh, in the first all india pediatric uh, hematology oncology fellowship exit examination in 2009 he also won the gold medal uh, during his uh, medical uh, days from jammu medical college jammu in 2001 and university gold medal by jammu university for the first position in mbbs in the year 2000 uh, also uh, nanak chand gold medal award in 2000 by the bestowed on him by the president of india his excellency abdul kalam in the convocation of university of jammu um, and uh, he has also awarded the best medical graduate award by the university of jammu uh, he has been uh, uh, working on blood and marrow transplantation in children for several years now and his primary interest is to develop novel techniques newer techniques like haplo identical transplants using Alpha beta TCA depletion techniques. He has an experience of more than 1,000 transplants in children, over 60 publications and many book chapters to his credit. Uh, he has been a pioneer in writing up 
brain tumor management uh, guidelines for Indian children and newer techniques of marrow transplantation in children. Primary research interest of Dr. Sunila Graft versus host defense of the BMT and uh, virus specific T cell therapy and infection uh, post BMT. So, with this brief uh, uh, introduction about our guest speaker today, uh, I would like to request Dr. Sunila to uh, kindly give us uh, an overview about uh, the role of hematopoietic stem cell transplant in pediatric genetic diseases. Over to you, Dr. Sunil. Uh, so, good afternoon, very uh, everyone, and um, thank you, Dr. Anirbar, for this opportunity, first of all. And uh, it was not at all a brief introduction. So, I was thinking that people are going to sign off and go. So, um, uh, thanks for this opportunity, and thank you, uh, Professor Satish, for uh, your time uh, to be part of us today. And uh, Arti, as usual, has been a great collaborator, including Dr. Bharti, uh, who we have been knowing for many years now. So, great initiative from the consortium as well as from the Niti University. So, um, I think you guys are doing a great job. I will try. I, I know it's going to be a purely a clinical talk, but I will try to put some perspective in some of the work which you do. And also, uh, you know, we'll be happy to take questions uh, at the end of the session if you have any. Um, so, uh, as was introduced, I'm, I'm going to be talking. So, uh, is, a, is a slideshow visible, Dr. Nirbhan? Yes. Yeah. So as as was as was you know in, you know said introduction, I'm going to be talking to about um, something about role of uh, stem cell transplantation in pediatric genetic diseases, which is one of the major chunk of uh, transplants which we do in pediatrics. Before we do that, I'm just going to start with the case presentation. Um, this is a uh, 16 month, 16 17 month old baby who presented with us with a uh, history of not gaining weight. There were multiple swellings all over the body. And there was abnormal distinction uh, of the child for six months. Now, this is a product of a secondary consanguineous marriage, the only living child in the family. And the uh, two elder siblings had similar complaints and they had uh, severe disseminated limb, uh, BCG infection after BCG vaccination they had got at the time of birth. And both of these elder siblings died at the age of six months. Fortunately, because of this history, this child was not immunized at all um, uh, in, his, in his infancy. He was well to nine months of age, but then he started developing recurrent pneumonia. And uh, you know, as 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 would happen in India on a usual basis, so they this child because there was non-resolution of pneumonia, it was coming again and again. He was treated as tuber, uh, tuberculosis and started anti-tubercular drugs. How there was no response to the anti-tubercular drugs. He continued to have abdominal swellings. He continued to have abdominal distension, and uh, he continued to have failure to thrive. But he had a good appetite, but he was not gaining weight or growing, um, uh, you know, at all. And this is a child when he presented to us, uh, you know, um, at the time of presentation. If you see here, uh, you know, he basically uh, has, uh, uh, you know, a very uh, emaciated look. There was pallor. There was lymphadenopathy. The neck swellings were there. And uh, there was a typical rash this child had, which was erythrodermic scaly rash all over his body, and there was hepatosomegaly on examination. So this is, you know, uh, the, the kid when he presented to us. Uh, the basic evaluation which was done showed a very severe uh, anemia, low hemoglobin levels. His white cell count was high. We did other evaluations for like ANA, torch profile, tubercular testing, uh, testing for tuberculosis, uh, PCR, as well as quantifron gold, all of that came came negative and was not suggestive of any uh, any diagnosis. Now, because there was lymph endopathy as well as hepatosomegaly, we ended up doing a lymph liver as well as lymph node biopsy. That also didn't show much, you know, it was just showing lymphocytic infiltration, um, but it showed that there was a deep, you know, significant infiltration of CD5 and CD3 positive cells, which are the T cells. Uh, in in the paracortical areas of the lymph node, so there are a lot of T cells in his in his lymph node, but it also wasn't suggestive of any particular diagnosis. Now, if we look at his history, you know there is a history of two sibling deaths, uh, you know repeated infections, uh, failure to thrive. So primary immunodeficiency was something which we suspected and we investigated accordingly. Chronic granulomatous disease and leukocytogen defect are the two common immunodeficiency disorders, <clears throat> which can present like this, but it was negative for that. Um, immunoglobin profiles to see the function of the uh, of the of the B lymphocytes was normal. Uh, we did something called as T cell functional work. Well, this is unfortunately not available here. So we did uh, we sent a sample to NIH Mumbai where they looked at his lymphocyte analysis 
and what they you know showed uh, you know corresponded with us was that the t and b subsets were normal in number but what was the what the problem with this child was that these t lymphocytes were not proliferating in response to stimulus so when we do a PHA induced T cell proliferation, it was normal. But then when it was response to NTCD3 and NTCD8 was abnormal. It was it was pretty low as compared to the normal control. And this was repeated on a repeat sample on two different occasions. So hence a rare diagnosis of a, uh, a diagnosis of a rare T cell functional defect was made. So this is many years ago. This was I think it's 2013 or 14. Um, you know when we looked after this child, and uh, as you all would know that that point of time. Uh, we didn't have a good access to, uh, you know, the genetic evaluation here in India at that point of time. So this was the diagnosis which we made just on the functional uh, analysis of the of the T lymphocytes done at Janaish Mumbai. Um, uh, we knew that bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant may be the only cure for this uh, for this child. But because we didn't know, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, there was no fully matched sibling donors. There was nothing, no no living, uh, you know, sibling in the family. There was no unrelated donor who was a match uh, with this patient, and hence we thought we'll take one of the parents as a donor for the bone marrow transplant. Now, because you know, as we all know, that most of these immunodeficiencies are either X-linked or autosomal recessive, and autosomal recessive means both the parents would be carriers, and X-linked and the mother is probably a carrier. So, just to be on the safer side, because we didn't know the genetic. Um, lesion in this particular particular family, particular child, we didn't know the inheritance pattern. So we used uh, father as a donor to be on the safer side, just in case it's X-linked. We didn't want to use the mother as a as a donor. So uh, father was taken as a donor as a haploid transplantation. I'll explain that later on what that would mean. And this is the same child now. He had hematological recovery, and his chimeras was hundred percent at day thirty, and I was four to five years post transplant. And this is his picture. Uh, at one month post transplantation, he looks a completely different child. He has put on weight, um, his, uh, the rash has dissolved, the lymph nodes have resolved, and his organomegaly is also dissolved. So, it's the same child which was there, which I showed the previous picture. Now, he's been um, transplanted and um, at plant. Um, as I said, he's four years post transplant now, clinically well. So, this was just an example to show you how you know some of these rare diseases can, can, can really, um, you know. Uh, Havoc the you know create havoc in the families, and this is uh, you know uh, how you can make it really make a difference in the in, in these families and in these uh, in, in you know suffering from uh, these genetic disorders. Now, while this uh, you know uh, the the this child we were working uh, we were treating the mother was pregnant at that point of time, and uh, she was almost sixteen weeks pregnant. We knew the diagnosis in this child is a T cell function defect. As I said, we didn't have a genetic diagnosis. We couldn't offer any antenatal uh, screening for the, you know, for the for the for the pregnant uh, for the for the for the fetus, and uh, uh, we counselled the family. The family chose to continue the pregnancy because we couldn't offer any antenatal testing. It was already sixteen week advanced pregnancy, so they they went off with the fourth fourth child who was. Um, born and because this time we knew the genetic, you know, we knew the um, the the um, the defect in the particular uh, this particular child index child, and we ended up investigating the the, the baby when it was born pretty quickly, and um, unfortunately the fourth child who is this who who is an, now the second living sibling of this family had also the similar um, T cell proliferation defect, and he was also transplanted. Using his using the father's stem cells is also cured of his disease. So two children who are alive now um, also had uh, the T cell functional defect, but both of them cured with a bone marrow transplantation. Now before um, the first uh, child, index child was transplanted, we had taken some blood samples. One of the labs here in Bangalore at that point of time um, offered some help to uh, you know work up these children uh, the, the blood samples and what they identified was a novel um, mutation in interferon gamma receptor two region and that was probably the reason uh, why you know we were seeing this type of phenotype in the um, in these children you know um, uh, which usually manifested in terms of you know uh, T cell functional defect and viral infections BCG infection. And um, also, um, probably tuberculosis in uh, the earlier two children who who had expired. So that was the genetic lesion in this. But unfortunately, this genetic genetic diagnosis came even after the transplant of these um, the children. The things have changed since. I think we have now, uh, you know, have got good access to good genetic workups. The NGS has taken uh, has has been very well established now, and the diagnosis these days are not usually a concern. Uh, um, you know, on the on the genetic workups.
Now that was an interesting case to you know just to give, give set the tempo. Uh, what you know uh, how these genetic diseases can really uh, you know um, impact the families and how a bone marrow transplant can really change the the lives of these children and the families. Now this is not a new treatment. The first bone marrow transplantation was done by E. Sir Donald Thomas, uh, who did the first bone marrow transplant on a child with acute leukemia in 1957. Now this tra this transplant done, was done from an identical twin. Um, that that child had a twin who acted who acted as a donor and was transplanted for for acute leukemia. Now this gentleman is the is the, is considered as the father of uh, bone marrow transplantation. That was uh, and he was bestowed on with the Nobel Prize in 1990 uh, for the work done in bone marrow transplant field. But what was the problem is that the first transplant, as I said, was successful. You know, it was it was done in 1957. But the, but the problem which happened after that is that the second, third, fourth, fifth, back to back, all the transplants failed. Um, and this was happening in Seattle in USA. That's where the transplant activity started in 1957. And the second, third, and fourth transplant, they were all uh, didn't didn't succeed. These these patients used to develop. Um, you know, um, um, severe diarrhea, skin rash, mm -hmm. as well as jaundice, and they would die uh, six to seven, uh, eight days into transplantation. No, no one knew what the problem is because the first, uh, first one went really well. They stopped the program of bone marrow transplant in Seattle, and they went back into dogs to do some dog experiments, and uh, that's how the, uh, you know, the uh, what came in, uh, what was discovered was something called as dog mm -hmm. or canine leukocyte antigen system. Then they came back in humans and and discovered in humans something called as human leukocyte antigen system, and that's very important because what has happened in the first patient is that because they're identical twins, so unknowingly the HLA system matched between the patient and the donor, and that's why the transplant was successful. But what happened post that the second, third, fourth, fifth transplant, they were not HLA match, and because they were not HLA match, these patients developed what we call as severe graft versus host disease and died because of severe graft host disease. And actually, this little well, again, we'll discuss HLA system later, but that's how the evolution of HLA system and how the discovery was. Now, as I said, you know, there is uh, there's a huge, um, you know, a contribution of pediatrics into the bone marrow transplant field. The first transplant, as I said, was a, a child with acute leukemia. Then a few years later, in 1968, a first non villain transplant was done, and that was done for, for immuno, immunodeficiency by the gentleman here, who is called Robert Good and considered his father of um, you know, immunology. And he uh, did uh, you know, a first non malignant transplant in children, and that was for uh, immunodeficiency. The first cord blood transplant in the world was also done on a pediatric patient and that was done by this the, by this lady whose name is Elaine Gluckman she is very st very still very active in transplant world she did the first transplant uh, using a cord blood on a patient with congenital bone marrow failure then that was Fenkin anemia the child uh, was diagnosed with Fenkin anemia in the US they didn't have a donor there who could donate for him the child was flown from US to Paris and that you know, the child had to transplant for anemia in Paris because at that point of time, FD had not recognized cord blood transplantation as a, as a treatment modality. Now, this person who had anemia at that time is now almost 48, 49 years of age, cured of his anemia, and that was the first cord blood transplant done, done in the world. And, and the credit goes to this lady and again, uh, contribution by the pediatrics. Now we discussed something about HLA system, and as I told you, one of the differences between a bone marrow transplantation and um, a uh, a solid organ transplant, like kidney, bone, uh, kidney, liver, heart, lungs, pancreas, and others, is that in solid organ transplants, you just need a match on blood group. So you need to be blood group compatible between the patient and the donor. You really don't need HLA match. But in bone marrow transplantation, you know you need what's called as HLA match between the patient and the donor. And we know the HLA system is inherited from our parents. We get half from the mother and half from the father. And we have got something called as uh, two antigen systems, class one and class two. And we kind of need to match between the class one and class two antigens between the uh, between the two, uh, between the patient and the donor. This is an example of how HLA, HLA typing is done. This is an example of a low result HLA typing wherein you know just the first digit or what we call as antigen. And if you see the patient here has got A1, A11. If you see the brother here, A1, A11, but the second brother is A1, A24. Similarly on B, this person, the first brother is matching, the second is not matching. And the DRB1, the first is matching, the second is not matching. So for this patient, the first brother is a six by six match and, um, and can be used as a donor because they are from the same 
parents, their biological siblings, low resolution x-ray typing is good enough for matching. But when we match a patient with someone else, which is not the family, which is not a sibling, it may be some other family member or even some unrelated donor. In that case, we need something called as high resolution typing. This is an example of high resolution typing wherein you check on five different loci, A, B, C, D, R, B1, and D, Q, B1. These are the five different loci where you check. And you check it not at antigen level, but also at LE level. So that's why that's what we call as 10 by 10 match, 6 by 10 match, 5 by 10 match, depending on how many alleles are matching between the patient and the donor you label them as uh, you know uh, you give them a, a, the matching kind of uh, you know score what exactly they do so we prefer 10 by 10 matches for unrelated donors or maybe some other family member match donor who's not a sibling so we need to match them on high resolution and match them on 10 different alleles or 10 different loci now that was on something on the history and we discussed uh, HLA typing and the relevance of HLA typing in bone marrow transplantation. Now, you know, when we talk about bone marrow transplant, it's basically, you know, uh, uh, the mo more scientific term would be hematopoietic stem cell transplant. That means we are giving hematopoietic stem cells from a donor into the patient. Now, these hematopoietic stem cell transplants are different from embryonic stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, multiple cells. We are not discussing about those. We know there's a lot of work going on in mesenchymal stem cells, which are taken from umbilical cord tooth bud, adipose tissue, but this is again, we're not discussing about them because they're still experimental and they're, they are being tested or experimented on some conditions which are non hematological conditions. What we're talking today is about hematological, um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which is, uh, you know, uh, giving hematopoietic stem cells, which have the capacity to produce blood components uh, from the patient to the donor. Now, what are the different types of transplant? One is something called as autologous transplant. That means you take the stem cells of the patient and give it back to the patient. Now, why you want to do that, I'll explain you in a minute. Allergen transplant, on the other hand, is where you take stem cells from a, from, from a healthy donor and give it to the patient. So there's somebody else's stem cells are used in allergenic transplant, which can be a math sibling. It can be a brother or sister who's matched with the patient. Uh, it can be matched unrelated. So that means if you do not have a free matched family donor, you can look for a donor anywhere in the world. So the chances of someone in the world matching you ranges from one in 20,000 to one in million. And there may be someone in the world who has got same HLA typing as a patient has got. And that's called as unrelated donor transplant. Now, nowadays we can also do something called as haplogenic transplantation or half match transplants, which was not possible, you know, a uh, few years ago. And that's, what, uh, you know, the first few transplants which I said have all failed, they were basically half match transplants because there were family members who are not a complete match with the patient. Always, you know, mother, father, or biological mother, father, always haplo matched with the, with, the, with the child. So children usually have always have a parent who's half matched with them and can donate for them. And sometimes siblings can be half matched or they can be full match as well. As well. And sometimes the, in, in older people, you can have your children who are half matches with you. So practically, when you use a half match donor, you have donor for everyone. Uh, you know, uh, a possible transplant for everyone because you can use half match donors. Cord blood can also be a source of stem cells, and that's called as cord blood transplantation. Now, rarely you can have identical twin as a donor. That's called syngenic transplant. I told you the first transplant we've done ever in the history was syngenic transplant for identical twin, but it it is usually a very rarity that I we get a uh, identical twin and can be used as a donor for transplant purpose. Now, what are the stem source of the stem cells? I told you the hematopoietic stem cells are the ones which we are talking about here. And these stem cells can be taken from bone marrow, it can be taken from peripheral blood, and it can be taken from cord blood. And I'll explain you each one of them in a little bit of detail. So bone marrow harvest, this is the this is a traditional way of collecting stem cells from uh, you know uh, 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 from the donor. So what happens here is that the donor is admitted to the to, to the uh, to the hospital for a day or so. It's done in general anesthesia. You see two, two operators here, they're pulling out the bone marrow from the iliac um, crest of the donor. And that is what is rich in stem cells and given to the patient uh, as a blood transfusion, uh, as, as, as a source of stem cells. Now, this is the disadvantage of this procedure that is done is under anesthesia. It takes a day of admission is required. And also that sometimes you can, you can take only 15 to 20 ml of marrow from the donor. And you need at least 5 to 10 ml of ml per kg of marrow for the patient so sometimes the patient is big and the donor is small you may not get enough 
uh, bone marrow at a given point of time for the transplant purpose. In that case, you may have to you know use this um, bone marrow transplant uh, as harvest done at two different settings. Do it once and then wait for four to six weeks and collect more cells and give all both of them together. Or you can change to the other mechanism, which is called as peripheral stem cell transplant collection. So what happens peripheral stem cell collection is that the donor gets growth factor called GCSF for four to five days. What the GCSF does is that it increases the number of stem cells in the peripheral blood of the patient, of the donor. And these stem cells are collected from the blood of the donor by this machine, which is exactly like a platelet machine. You know, some of you must have given platelets. It, it collects stem cells uh, in this small pouch of blood here, which is, looks red on the left-hand corner. And that is that is uh, a stem cell collection, which happens there. And these are the ones which are given to the patient after uh, the collection. This is an outpatient procedure. It takes, takes, it takes two to three hours and the donor doesn't need to be admitted to the, to the hospital. And we get enough stem cells and the weight patient and patient donor weight discrepancy really doesn't uh, apply here and we can get enough cells even from small donors. This is an example of a child uh, donating uh, and this is an example where the child donates stem cells for, him, for himself in autologous transplant. So you see there's blood coming out from one direction from the left uh, inguinal region. It goes in the machine, spins the blood there, stem cell is collected and goes back into the patient's, uh, into the donor's body through the cannula on the right hand side with the pink cannula. Now the third source of stem cells can be cord blood. And when a baby is born, cord blood can be taken and stored um, in the cord blood banks. Um, and uh, this is how the cord blood bank, uh, you know, when we require it for transplant, it's how it comes to the transplant center, the liquid nitrogen tanks. You take that small pouch of blood out. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, 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 if you see this cord blood looks like this, it's about 25 to 30 ml of blood. But one of the beautiful things about cord blood is that it, it is very rich in stem cells. The number of stem cells in cord blood concentration is the highest. The second advantage is that it comes from newborn babies who have not seen the outside world yet. They're immunologically naive. And because of that, you um, you know do not see a lot of graft versus host disease due to cord blood. And you don't need a perfect 10 by 10 or perfect 6 by 6 match with a cord blood. You can have a little bit less than perfect match also. With cord blood, you can use 5 by 6, 4 by 6 matched donor because they are immunologically naive. But the, but the disadvantage of the cord blood is that it is, although it is rich in stem cells, but the volume is very, very small, it's so about 25 to 30 ml. So the number of stem cells in a cord blood unit may not be sufficient for uh, a big child or an adult. And in that case, we may have to use either two or three cords together to give the adequate stem cell dose. So that's about the cord blood transplant. Now, this is just a you know cartoon to show you uh, what the transplant process would look like. Now, before the patient is admitted here, um, I'm not sure how to do the arrow here, but anyways, so uh, before the patient is admitted, um, you know, you, you do something called as donor to patient evaluation. So you make sure that the donor is well, uh, patient is well, and uh, uh, the, uh, they are not carrying any infections which can be transmitted, they, they, you know, uh, from the donor to the patient. So you make sure that everything is okay, and then you admit the patient to the, to the hospital. Once the patient is admitted to the hospital, you do something called as conditioning. Conditioning is a, is, is, is a mixture of, uh, you know, chemotherapy drugs, sometimes used, you know, irradiation also. And the idea of that is to destroy the bone marrow of the patient. It takes seven to eight days. Once it's done, then you collect the stem cells from the donor, which can be either bone marrow, it can be either peripheral blood, or it can be cord blood, which I showed in the previous slide. And then you collect those cells and give it to the to the patient. As I said, the, the, the infusion goes like a blood blood infusion. It's not a surgical process. It's just an infusion of the stem cells into the, into the patient's body. Now, what happens because of this conditioning is that if you see the orange graph here, the, the, the bone marrow of the patient is destroyed and they, everything comes down. The hemoglobin, platelets, white cells absolutely become zero. So white cells become absolutely zero in few days after condition is over. Now, after a few days, after a couple of weeks, now slowly what happens that that new star cells start coming up. And we always hope and pray that the new cells which are coming up are from the donor cells. And that's what's called as engraftment. So it takes a couple of weeks for the new cells to start working and come up in the patient's body. And that's what we engraftment is called. Now, as, as we can all kind of guess, this is the most important time point in the transplant journey. The, the, when the counts are very, very low. So the patient has got no immune system at all. And there are no immune, immune cells. There's white cells absolutely zero. Your mucosa is already uh, inflamed uh, or injured with the condition which are given them. So they're sting ducts of inf for infection. And that's why we need to you know, uh, look after these patients in special bone marrow transplant rooms wherein you have 
HEPA-filtered air circulation systems so that the air which goes in doesn't carry um, any organisms, especially fungal infection, fungal infection spores. Um, the, the, they get neutropenic diet, they get strict one is to one nursing, and a lot of stress on infection control. Now, once the counts come up after a month, you know, two to three weeks, they become normal, and that's the time when the counts become normal, the things start settling down, infection still settles down, mucosis, mucositis settles down, and that's the time when we discharge them from the hospital to the home, and that's why the admission process for bone transfer is for approximately one month. Now, what happens? This is just a cartoon show exactly the same thing. So, there will be conditioning before transplantation. Transplant would be infusion of the cells. We'll have a period of neutropenia, uh, blood counts being very, very low, and then engraftment happens and the blood counts come to normal levels. Now, what happens after that? When the blood counts come to normal levels, we look after two, three problems. One is called as graft versus host disease. That means the cells of the donor are attacking patient's body. And when, you, when the donor is attacking patient's body, you can lead to what's called as graft versus host disease. And that's what happened in the second, third, fourth, fifth transplant, which all failed because they developed very bad graft versus host disease because HLA was not matching, right? So that's graft versus host disease we need to look for. These patients will be on immunosuppression. There will be an immunosuppression medications for six months to one year post transplant there's another difference between a bone marrow transplant and a solid organ transplant in solid organ transplant you need lifelong immunosuppression because there's a lifelong risk of rejection of that foreign organ in the patient's body but in bone marrow transplantation you're giving a new immune system to the patient from somebody else and you these immune system from somebody else slowly gets adapted to your body and then you don't require a lifelong immunosuppression so usually stop immunosuppression by six months to one year post transplantation that's number one. Second problem which we kind of um, you know look for post transplant is opposite of graft associated is that's called as graft rejection. That means the patient's body is not accepting the donor cells, is not letting the donor cells grow in his or her body, and that will be something called as rejection, and that's what we look for um, in the next few months post transplantation. Usually one year is a good time post transplant to be be, be sure to be to assure the family and be assured yourself that things are okay. And the patient after one year of post, uh, post uh, transplant will start vaccination, children will start going to school and hence, you know, they will be a non on any immunosuppression and they will be uh, you know, living like a normal life like anyone else. Now, what are the conditions when bone marrow transplant is required? Now, um, this is autologous transplant indication. That means when you're giving patients own stem cells in the, in, and collecting for the patient, giving back to the same patient his own or her own stem cells are giving back to the patient. It's usually used in conditions where the bone marrow is absolutely normal. Bone marrow doesn't have a problem, but there's a malignancy elsewhere in the body, like lymphomas, Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphomas, like solid tumors, neuroblastomas, living sarcoma, germ cell tumor, brain tumor. These are the conditions wherein there is bone marrow is fine, but there's cancer somewhere else. Now, how does it work in autologous transplant? So what happens when you give anyone who's got a cancer in the body and you give them anti-cancer treat treatment with chemotherapy, if you, if you increase the dose of chemotherapy, you will get more and more anti-cancer effect. But at the same time, when you increase the dose of chemotherapy to high levels, your bone marrow can get destroyed and may not recover from the effect of chemotherapy. And they may die of, not of cancer, but because of the bone marrow failure. So what happens here is that you collect the stem cells of the patient before you give them chemotherapy. After that collection of the stem cells, you give them very high dose of chemotherapy so that it can kill the cancer elsewhere in the body, which is not in the bone marrow, but elsewhere, and kills, the, kills that, uh, that malignancy. Now, once you give the chemotherapy, you give them stem cells back to them, which has been collected before giving chemotherapy. Stem cells will go in the patient's body, settle the bone marrow, and make the new bone marrow. So it helps the patient overcome the effect of chemotherapy on the marrow, and we are able to achieve a good anti-cancer effect. This table is a allogenic bone marrow transplantation. That means here you are using not patient's own cells, but somebody else's cells, and the somebody else is a healthy donor. Now this is usually used for malignant disorders where the bone marrow is involved, like leukemia, ALL, acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoid leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, lymphomas like Hodgkin's or non Hodgkin's when they affect the bone marrow especially, myelodysplasias. These are the malignant conditions of the bone marrow where you use allogenic transplantation that means somebody else's. It's also used for a lot of congenital disorders. Uh, which are non-malignant, like immunodeficiency disorders, hemoglobinopathies, where the hemoglobinopathy capital of the world, we have the majority, maximum number of thalassemias born in our country, bone, bone marrow failure syndromes, storage disorders. This we'll discuss a little bit in the next few slides, but that's the core of our uh, session today. 
um, and acquired disorders like aplastic anemia and paroxysmal octal hemorrhage. This list is not extensive, but you can see the flavor in this list is that these are all life-threatening diseases which do not have any other alternative um, treatment option. And we can cure maximum a majority of these patients by bone marrow transplantation. Now, coming on to how does the bone marrow transplant work then? It, trans it works in three different mechanisms. It, it, it works in, it, you know, you can give high dose of chemotherapy and we can achieve what's called as dose response curve. And that's why I explained you in the autologous transplantation. That means in those autologous transplants, you give them a very high dose of chemotherapy and then give the stem cells back to them so that their bone marrow recovers. That's how it works in, in autologous transplant. It also works as immunotherapy. So we all know for leukemia, for example, uh, what is the, the speculation is that leukemia develops because there's a there's a failure of our immune surveillance. Every day in our body, a lot of malignant cells are formed, a lot of leukemia cells are formed, but our body identifies them and kills them. If this mechanism fails, this immune surveillance fails, you can develop a full blood, full blown leukemia, or full blown malignancy. Now, what happens in bone marrow transplantation is you give cells, stem cells from someone else. You're giving a new immune system to someone else. And when you do that, you are able to achieve, you, these cells will go in the patient's body and identify these abnormal cells and kill them. And that's called a graph versus tumor effect or graph versus leukemia effect as a kind of immunotherapy you are giving, you know, giving them. There's also, this works as a gene therapy. So in genetic conditions like, like, like thalassemia, like Franklin anemia, there's a gene defect. And you're giving them new cells from a healthy donor who's got that normal gene. So you're replacing a defective gene by a normal gene. And that's, you know, the HVX, like a gene therapy in those conditions. Now, what are the conditions that we have practice, which are genetic in nature, where bone marrow transplant is helpful? Now, there's a list of immunodeficiency disorders. You don't need to get into the details of each one of them. But, you know, I want to tell you that immunodeficiency disorders is a large group of patients in our country. In, there's an estimation that almost 2 lakh children in India are born in immunodeficiency every year. We are not still diagnosing even 1% of these immunodeficiency and disorders. But thankfully, as I said earlier, with newer diagnostic modalities, with the, you know, with the advent of NGS availability uh, you know, uh, in our daily practice, I think more and more are getting diagnosed. Um, there are various forms of immunodeficiency. Severe common immunodeficiency is one. And it, there's a different genetic lesions which can lead to severe common immunodeficiency. viscoch alder syndrome, again common, especially in South India. So these are the immunodeficiency disorders, uh, which uh, you know is a large chunk, chunk of patients where transplant is the only curative option uh, for the patient. And now talking about infantile malignant osteopetrosis, again. Not a very common condition, but we know, the, especially the pediatricians and the pediatric, uh, you know, genetic, genetic specialists, they soon see, uh, you know, a quite significant chunk of this. Bone transfer is, is, is curative, to, except for one mutation, which is OSTM1 mutation. So it's very important to, when you diagnose some of the amelian osteopetrosis, identify what mutation they have, because only less than 5% of the patients may have this mutation, OSTM1, where bone transfer doesn't help, but in all other patients, bone transfer is the only curative option. Now, looking at uh, another group of diseases, which is very controversial, is storage disorders. So, you know, the, uh, storage disorders, one group is mucopolysaccharidosis. Now, when we talk about this mucopolysaccharidosis in West, we talk about enzyme replacement therapy as a treatment option. But enzyme replacement therapies in India, either they're not available or they're too expensive. So, the, if, if you, even if you want to procure them, the cost is crores of rupees every year. And this has to be lifelong. So it's very difficult for our children to have enzyme replacement therapies in, in our country. So some of these conditions can be treated by bone marrow transplantation. And I'm happy to share with you that we have one of the largest experience of, um, of bone marrow transplant storage on children in India. And, you know, thanks to Dr. Minakshi, but who has been closely collaborating with us. And a lot of patients have come from her center for bone marrow transplant, both for MPS and other storage disorders. Now, what's very important to know that some MPS is some, some storage disorders. Here you see MPS1, MPS6, MPS7 have got proven benefit of transplant. Now there are others like MPS2, MPS4, where there's still doubtful role where we are investigating still. We have done some few MPS2s also and MPS4s also. I feel it's way too early to say. I feel, you know, they also get benefited. Their enzyme at least are getting normalized post-transplant, but we have, we have to you know, follow them up for a longer time. Same is for lysosomal storage disorders. If you see Gaucher's disease, alpha minocytosis, name and pick three, you know, BNC, these all can be can be transplanted and cured. But there are some diseases in lysosomal disorders, like Lyme, name and pick A, like Gaucher's type 2, they cannot be treated with bone marrow transplant. So it's very important, even in this group of diseases, to have the actual uh, or, or, the, or the exact ecological diagnosis, the exact genetic diagnosis, so that we know actually what 
type of uh, you know uh, actual type of disease they belong to group, disease group category they belong to and whether they can be transplanted and cured with that bone transplant or not do you see here you know a typical example gaucheous type 1 and type 3 can be cured but type 2 cannot be cured with bone marrow transplant so it's very important to understand the exact genetic lesion uh, when we plan to transfer some of these diseases leukodystrophies excellent leukodystrophy again a common problem in males metachromal leukodystrophy bone marrow transplant can be cured too however it may not be helping in some of these like gelvejet syndrome it doesn't really work uh, in um, uh, uh, in this condition so another group of disorders which is you know very uh, um, you know common in pediatric practice is macrophage disorders or granulocytic disorders primary hlh primary hlh again used to be a you know dust been diagnosis before we didn't diagnose them very well but now uh, with more and more i would say index of suspicion and uh, education i think a lot of patients who were initially treated as sepsis or you know hlh but not given a label but uh, you know now we know that most of them are primary hlh in children uh, congenital neutropenia leukosyrigen defect shidak higashi syndrome chronic glandular disease gracili syndrome i know these are all tongue twisters were being there pretty pretty common in pediatric practice and um, all of them have only bone marrow transplant as a curative option there is no other way you can cure these conditions bone marrow failure syndrome a big chunk of disease and there is a lot of interest of this consortium in bone marrow failure there is fenkin anemia there is shoman diamond syndrome or discarotis congenita there is nothing else you can do except for a bone marrow transplant to cure these conditions i spent couple of minutes on thalassemia major i know it's a little bit uh you know uh, uh, off track here because i i don't think you deal too much with this condition um in your in your consortium but this is the commonest genetic disease in pediatrics which is transplanted in india so as we know that transplant offers the only lasting cure for thalassemia patients and if you see the data from italy uh, which was published a few years ago they followed up the transplant patients over a period of 20 years and what they saw saw that 20 or a period of 20 years about 75% of the patients you know were cured forever and they had a long uh, good quality of life at the same time the patients in the red line here patients who had thalassemia major but were not transplanted because they didn't have a donor to transplant or they didn't they were not willing for a transplant and over a period of 10 years less than 20 of 20% of them were alive and well so this kind of this graph shows proof of the principle that bone marrow transplant is effective uh, treatment as less well gives a uh, long lasting cure for the patient with thalassemia major and believe and 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 this is uh, a with little old data this is the patient of 1981 with a transplant in the center things have not gone better what they also showed in that study in in from italy is that thalassemia is three diseases in fact you know if the patients who are managed very well that's for as class 1s uh, or the uh, and the patients who are not managed very well they have hepatomegaly liver fibrosis uh, you know they are not chelated very well why it was important because class 1s you can cure about 90 to 95% of the patients class 2s is intermediate 85 to 80 88% percent patients and class 3s do not do very well uh, 70 to 75% percent patients can be cured now this is important here because you know when we manage the thalassemia patients it's very important to keep them in a good shape in good class in low risk class so that they can be cured uh, and the chances of cure are quite higher so i will skip other few slides because they are think more technical for hematology point of view and uh, Uh, what are the complications we have to address in thalassemia graft rejection i have already discussed graft osmosis i have already discussed there's a typical complication that happens in in thalassemia is called the venous of the liver liver gets swollen up it gets clots in inside the liver that's because these these children usually get chronic blood transfusions and iron overload and because of that the liver is fibrotic and hence they develop venous of the liver is some, something important for us to look after now what is the status in india with bone marrow transplantation this is a little uh, you know uh, couple of year old slide now things are almost pretty similar in the last two years also um you know transplant in india started in 1980s but initially it was very very few transplants done or you know in a year um from the last 2 3 years from 2017 onwards we are doing doing more than 2000 transplants in, in the country every year and that is all the centers put together now what is the estimation estimation in india is that we need 2 lakh transplants every year we are doing 2000 and we are doing probably 1% of transplant was required for the country of our size so there's still a long way to go now what are the conditions which are transplanted if you look at the pediatric conditions here uh, as i said one third of the patients in india were transplanted in children less than 18 years of thalassemics uh, 
followed by bone marrow, you know, aplasia or aplastic anemia, ALL, AML, and then other genetic diseases which form small percentage but then contribute a significant proportion of children who are transplanted in India uh, uh, from, from various centers. This is the data from the ISCTR, which is our registry where we all report our data annually, um, uh, you know, um, as a group. Now, what's our experience in, in, in uh, Naran Health State, Bangalore? We have completed about 1,400 transplants here. Be being a referral center, we do mainly haploidental transplant and allergenic transplantation, less of autologous transplants. And for all the indications which I showed you in the previous slide, both malignant, non malignant, as well as genetic diseases. Now, if you look at genetic diseases only, uh, this is a, you know, a, in fact, a couple of year old slide again, there's some more changes which have happened here. Uh, Hemoglobopathy is still a large chunk here, about 250 odd patients. Uh, primary immunodeficiency disorders, bone marrow failure syndrome, storage disorders, and malignancies following, following being the rest. So half of the transplanted pediatric practice at our center is basically for genetic diseases in children, and the other half is for malignancies. Now we have the largest bone marrow transplant center for children in the country. We do about 120 to 130 transplants for children every year, and uh, this is just the distribution of the patients. So again, for thalassemia, in our experience, this is class one in our experience in, in Narayana Health City, Bangalore, 18 class one transplants. All of them are surviving, but one patient has rejection. So you know, survival uh, thalassemia cure is about 95 percent. If we look at class two and class threes, which I which I told you are are not a good risk transplant patient but unfortunately in our country most of the patients come in class 2 class 3 they're not managed very well initially for thalassemia 135 transplants which are analyzed a couple of years ago and in that 135 we could cure about 88 percent of the patients uh, with in class 2 and class 3 so um, this is exactly the data which has come from italy so in in, in summary in thalassemia we can cure about um, 85 to 95 percent of the patients, depending on what class they belong to. If they're low risk or class ones, about 95 percent can be cured. If they're class two, class three, what we call as low risk disease, or sorry, high risk disease, then about 95 percent can be cured. We can also, what's new in, so this is about thalassemia. Now, what's new in transplant world? One is that reduced intensity transplants we can do these days. The drugs which are used for transplants are becoming safer and safer. And that, that's what's called reduced intensity transplants. We can use uh, increasing recipient age doesn't apply in pediatric transplants because we can now transplant you know, patients who are 70, 72, 73 years of age as well. Um, virus stem cell source. I showed uh, you know, earlier an example of uh, the uh, um, you know, types of transplantation. So uh, for, you know, when we look for a transplant donor for a patient, the chances of finding a fully matched donor uh, in the family is about 25%. The, the chance of your brother sister matching is about 25 percent and if you find a do if we try to search for a donor of an unrelated donor in, elsewhere in the world uh, the chance of that finding donors about 10 percent so that means we're leaving around 60 to 70 percent of the patients who require transplants but do not have anyone to donate there's no fully matched donor for them and and and, and few years ago there would be no option for them but nowadays what we can do what we call is something called haploidal transplantation we can use half match donors and i told you earlier Mother, father um, are always half matches. Brother, sisters, if they're not half, ma if they're not full matches, they may be half matches. Your offspring's children can also be half match with you. So that means practically every patient will have a half match donor. This was the first half match transplant child uh, done in India in 2014. We are done here with a leukemia. The father was a donor. There was no siblings basically, and the child got cured of his leukemia. This was 2014, sorry, 2013 August. Was the first haplo transplant was done here for a child. A uh, lot of normal indications which I showed in the previous slides can be transplanted now. So this is also something new which is coming up. Uh, not only malignancy, but normal malignant indications can also be transplanted. Now some of the some of the audience here who may be you know kind of uh, interested in immunology, when you do half match transplantation, you are you know putting the patient to risk of graft versus host disease. Now we know that this graft versus host is mediated by T cells, and in T cells there are two types of bad T cells: alpha alpha. Uh, T cells and the beta T cells, which mediate graft for source disease. Nowadays, what we do, which is something called as graft engineering, we take the stem cells of the donor, we, we remove these alpha and beta T cells from the graft and give the rest of the graft uh, to the uh, to the patient. And that's what is called as T cell alpha beta depletion. We have got one of the largest experience of this in the, in Asia. We have done more than 110 transplants using this technique now, and it's really good. Uh, this was the first child in india with uh, with a condition called a megakaryotic thrombocytic purpura again a genetic condition um and his father was a half match donor he donated for him uh, and we use this technique of t-cell alphabet depletion as i said earlier 
you know, reduce intensity transplants. This is the oldest Indian to have, uh, in oldest thalassemic in India to have transplant. We did it a couple of years ago, three years ago, in fact. His sister was a donor, and we used these reduced intensity transplants for the child uh, to, to cure him of thalassemia. Now, I know we discussed a lot of science, but there's a lot of challenges, you know, ahead of us in bone marrow transplantation. One is delayed referrals. Some of these conditions, we get the patients quite late. You know, that there are three typical examples. One is immunodeficiency diseases. Sometimes you know they, they are already infected. They get very really bad infection before when they are referred, and unfortunately you can't do much with them. Aplastic anemia is another typical example where you get a de very delayed referral. And third is thalassemia major, which I just explained to you that when they are high risk, uh, when they have got big liver, high iron load, they may not be great candidates for transplantation. So delayed referral is another problem. Uh, in India, limited resources, you know, it's like these are expensive treatments. We don't have a great insurance system uh, for, for transplants here. We don't have, you know, good state funding. So, you know, uh, most of the times it's out of the pocket. So resource limitation is a challenge. However, things are changing now. There are a lot of funding, or, or, you know, opportunities available for, for, for patients with various diseases requiring transplantation. There's a lot of crowdfunding platforms helping and also you know, some philanthropy and CSR activity, which, which helps to, uh, you know, some of the children to undergo their, their treatments. Drug availability, not a huge issue now in India. We've got access to probably most of the drugs. Uh, manpower is a problem. We, this is a, mostly a nursing game. You know, nurses are the people who help hugely in a, in a bone marrow transplant program. And we do have this problem of, um, of uh, skilled uh, and stable nursing force because they work for a little while and then they uh, kind of move on. So that's been a challenge. Uh, uh, with uh, with some of our uh, you know uh, in our country and uh, donor registries, registries I told you that only ten percent of the patients from India get a fully matched donor in the donor registry. Why is that so? Because we are Indians, we'll match Indians. Uh, you know, uh, it, there's a lot of ethical. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, lo lot of um, um, you know the ethical background uh, plays a role in matching. So um, a yeah, North Indian is going to match a North Indian, a Bengali is going to match a Bengali. So if you've got a good mixture of our own ethical background communities in our donor registries, well, the chances are going to be higher. And we need a large number of donors in our registry. The registry do from our India, which is from Dhatri, has got over four lakh donors in the registry. And there's one more registry operates from Bangalore, which is called as DKMS BMST. They have about 50,000 donors on the registry. So putting them all together is four and a half lakh donors, for, which is very, very small uh, as compared to the size of our country. We need around one to two crore. Or we need about 10 to 20 million donors on our registry to make any difference so that we can find donors for our population. So there's a long way to go in, in, the, in the donor registry. So this is a unit, donor transfer unit at Dara LST Bangalore, as I was telling you, it's very important to keep them in these sterile environments when they are neutropenic and the counts are low and, and the nurses, as I said, are the backbone of this whole activity. Some of the children here, uh, if you see, these are children from, uh, some of them are still in the unit, some of them are ready, dressed up to go home. Um, we have a very strong international collaboration here uh, for bone marrow transplants. And if you see here, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, children from, from Nigeria, you have got children from Kenya, from Oman, Indonesia. And this was uh, uh, around two and a half years ago when we completed 1,000 transplants here. And there's a small celebration for that. You see a lot of smiling faces here. The outcomes of transplant children are excellent, um, uh, you know, as compared to adults. All the adults' outcomes have really improved also in the last uh, few years. But children really do well. And you see a lot of these children smiling and being cured of their conditions and, you know, ready to uh, be, uh, you know, have a, have a healthy, normal life and be meaningful, you know, uh, members of the, of the society. So that was my last slide. And... Uh, uh, I will stop here. Uh, I will uh, be very glad to take any questions if there are any. And uh, and uh, um, so, over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Anirban. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Sunil, for taking us through. Uh, that was a wonderful oversight uh, into the process and the challenges and the success stories and uh, the concluding it with the smiling faces. I think uh, it was a wonderful. Uh, uh, sum up of uh, all the activities that you're doing. Uh, uh, we are um, really um, amazed at uh, the kind of uh, uh, effort that goes in in all of that. And uh, the fact is, we do have a little bit of knowledge about all of these, but uh, the practical difficulties, the, the, the way it is done, the, the things that need to be taken care of, and, uh, and the 
process that needs to be in place. I think uh, that's a great challenge. Um, so thank you for um, giving that uh, wonderful insight into the, the process and into the, into the methods and the, the kind of uh, uh, disorders that uh, qualify and that do not qualify for uh, stem cell transplant. So um, before we um, uh, take up a few questions, uh, do we have uh, some um, comments from Dr. Arti? Uh, is there anything that uh, uh, yes, I, I would like to first of all uh, thank Dr. Sunil for an absolutely fantastic overview of what's happening in India and also what's happening uh, cutting edge wise in terms of, you know, the possibilities in, uh, of, uh, you know, what can be brought into India. Again, it's highly underpowered because the, uh, the matching systems are just not adequate for the needs of the country at the moment. So a lot of work needs to be done. career opportunities for you to, uh, you know, develop in this area and move forward because, uh, you know, if you can see cure in a patient, it is, I think, the most exhilarating thing for a doctor, I'm sure, you know, to see that a patient who is otherwise uh, de destined to die will, uh, you know, come up, uh, can actually be cured in, in these very horrible uh, circumstances. So thank you so much, Dr. Sunil. That was an absolutely fantastic uh, overview. I really appreciate uh, your uh, insights. Uh, I have a quick question, if I may, at this point, and that is, uh, you know, you had mentioned that uh, there are some, uh, for example, the lysosomal storage disorders, some of them respond well to bone marrow transplantation, whereas others don't. So what is the distinguish, how do you distinguish between ones that do and one that don't respond to them? You know, what is the reason why that happens? So it's a, it's a fantastic question and you know, to, be, to be honest with you, I don't think we know the answer. I think um, it is, is a question of, uh, you know, uh, in, in a storage disorder, in fact, most of them are enzyme, enzymopathies, you know, you've got a deficiency of some enzymes. Uh, so, the, so, so important thing is that whether these hematopoietic stem cells which are going to be engrafted from a donor, are they able to manufacture an enzyme first of all? That is, that is one. And second is that if they're able to manufacture the enzyme, is that an enzyme going to reach the, the, the target organ, you know. Uh, what we know is uh, that if there's a CNS, uh, for example, a CNS manifestation in some of these conditions, the enzyme, it, even if it's made, it may not be cro crossing the blood-brain barrier, it may not be even reaching there. So that's why, and, and now over the period of time, over the last experience, the last, you know, decade or so, now we know that some of these storage disorders, the outcomes are pretty good because the enzyme is made and enzyme does its job. But in some, we still really do not know, um, uh, you know, uh, what is that, uh, how much it's going to help and whether it helps at all. So, you know, that's why I put that in two different categories where we know there's a proven benefit. And uh, the second category is that there's a doubtful role and, uh, you know, where we still probably will say it's still experimental. And in, in some conditions, we already know that it really doesn't help. For example, Gaucher type 2, it doesn't really help. It's, it's a neuropathic Gaucher. It really doesn't help. In Newman pick A, it really doesn't help. It has been, you know, shown that doesn't really help. But yes, you know, um, in, in some it's still great. But in some diseases, you know, we know that, you know, for example, excellent agular liquid dystopy, fantastic results. You know, if it's done early on in the disease process, when they do not have severe neurological manifestations, they really do very well and they are really cured of the condition. So it depends on, I think, the disease uh, type, uh, what is the defect, uh, you know, whether the enzyme is made by the hematopoietic system or not and whether it is the target organ, target organ or not. I think that's what is important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, very, uh, thanks for that clarity. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you again for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, I uh, really appreciate your coming today. Uh, so I'll uh, hand it over again to Dr. Anirban and I'm sure he'll uh, conclude this with uh, many thanks to you. Before we thank uh, Dr. Sunil, I have a couple of questions for him. So I hope he'll be uh, willing to answer them for us. Okay, the first question is uh, the HLA typing that you mentioned at the beginning. Is it important for other forms of uh, transplant like, uh, you know, adult stem cell transplant or probably... Uh, you know, induced pluripotent stem cell transplant, or is it only for hematopoietic stem cell transplant? Okay, so uh, for hematopoietic stem cell transplant, of course, yes. Um, uh, whether it's 
you know pediatric adult whatever condition we use uh, them for hematopoietic stem cell transplant actually typing is important uh, but as i said that we uh, now can do transplants uh, overcoming actually barriers right uh, we can do half match transplants now uh, but then we need to know that there's a half match and we need to make strategies to address that half match so it's it's still very important for uh, uh, you know it may not be that much critical now to identify a donor but then it is in, it's critical uh, for us to understand uh, what is the mechanism of transplant going to be so yes it's very important both for children and adults with hematopoietic stem transplant now the question is does it uh, really apply for other type of transplant so solid organ really doesn't uh, it is it's used actually type is done in solid organ transplant but not for purpose of matching or outcomes it is mainly done for identifying you know what you call as relationships because you you know yet there's 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 this uh, there's a risk of uh, misuse of solid organs from unrelated uh, donors so hence they do it for identi identifying the the relationship with the with the patient but uh, but in in solid organ transplant is really the platinum compatibility which is very important now the third is about mesenchymal stem cells now in mesenchymal stem cells you know uh, mesenchymal stem cells are not usually used for transplantation but they are used for various other indications they are used for uh, in our in our world they are used for graft versus host disease but i know they are used in other uh, you know uh, other uh, i would say uh, specialties like orthopedics and um, neurosciences for maybe for spinal cord injuries and joint injuries and other things um, uh, as i said they are still evolving they are still experimental but in mesenchymal stem cells they do not you don't require an actually match because they don't express actually Uh, on them, so you can put third-party actually uh, visible ML cells in anyone. Uh, you know, you really don't need a match. So you really, in those conditions, a match or actually is, has got no significance at all. So I hope it answers the questions partly. Now, right. pluripotent cells, I didn't answer deliberately because I'm still not aware of uh, pluripotent cells being used for a transplant purpose. So I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. um uh, but it's as case is it's it's it really depends on whether they express actually or not if they don't then it's not really required i guess uh, generally are uh, more of autologous type so perhaps uh, that autologous you don't require actually so if you are using any autologous product yeah. for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for mesenchymal whatever you use you really don't need uh, uh, actually typing but when you use for uh, for a, for a, for an un, from a uh, you know uh, from a Uh, allogenic donor who is be, maybe a third party donor or a family donor then of course you would require in hematopoietic stem cell uh, domain and not in mesenchymal stem cell domain okay um so uh, there is uh, another question for you um so when you do this actually allele matching between the recipient and the donor is there a cut off that you need to have a defined cut off for a match or do you have a set uh, standards uh, laid out for this So there's a question on that. Yeah. So see, as I said earlier, uh, uh, you know, we okay. So we you have kind of evolved over a period of time. So there was a time maybe some seven eight years ago we would focus on eight alleles or four antigen levels. You know, um, A B C D R B one. These were the four important ones, and you match them on these four antigens with eight alleles. So that used to call as eight by eight match. Now, now this then the phase after that came. Okay, let's check for DQB one also. There's also little. It has also got some little significance, and that came the fifth antigen. Uh, two more alleles are added, and that becomes ten by ten. Uh, that's what we call as ten by ten match. Now, nowadays we also know that DPB one has got some role um, in, uh, in 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 you know uh, in graft resources especially, and uh, that's what the sixth allele, what is called as twelve by twelve. Right. So we evolved from eight to ten to twelve. Now, if you got what you, uh, you know, if you got multiple donors, if you got so eight by eight is eight by eight is essential. So you need eight by eight match donor. Now seven by eight can also be done. That means you are mismatching on one of these eight alleles. One is mismatch. But in what we have seen that the, in the practice is that the graft versus host disease, graft versus host disease risk is pretty high. And because a decade ago we had no other option, we would accept that graft versus host disease risk can go ahead with seven eight by channel transplant. Now, because today in today's uh, day we have haplo transplant as an alternative option, which uh, can be you know used even more effectively than seven by eight. So now today I don't do any seven by eight transplants or nine by ten transplants. I do only 
10 by 10 transplant, 8 by 8 transplant, and do not do any hap because I have an alternate haploid transplant if you don't have a fully matched donor. Now that is one. Now the second is that if you got a multiple donors, you have you have got 10 donors who are coming 8 by 8. Then you go down. Okay, let me see. There's a 10 by 10 donor out of these. Now let me go down again. If you have got now five donors who are 10 by 10, now let me go one more. Let me check DPB1 also. Is on DPB1 a, a 12 by 12, 12 donor? So as the matching levels goes up, your outcomes improve, especially in the context of graft versus host disease. So yes, today we want a you know 10 by 10 donor. Ideally, if you are not if the DP the, the DQB1 is the least important in the all these five areas, if you got a mismatch there, you still accept it. But I do, we do not accept any mismatch on the other four alleles, A, B, C, and DRB1, because haplo is an other alternative option with better outcomes than a seven by eight donor match. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, one more question. Like uh, we talked about the cancer patients when they have uh, when they which, uh, who qualify for autologous um, uh, stem cell transplant. So do you, when you collect the stem cells, do you enrich them before you give them back to them or do you just store them? Yeah, so, uh, you know, if I, I can answer that question a little differently. So, um, uh, there are some conditions, uh, for example, neuroblastoma, right? You can have malignancies, uh, malignancy in abdomen may be the primary cancer, but then it can spread to bone marrow, right? And that's called as high-risk neuroblastoma. Autologous transplant is still used as a treatment option for them. But there's a risk, hypothetical risk, that when you collect this autologous stem cells from them, these neuroblastoma cells also will be collected and giving it back to the patient once you're transfusing them back. So you're, you're, you may be giving them neuroblastoma cells also and, you know, potentially leading to relapse because of the neuroblastoma cells. So, so there are two things which happen there. There is something called as gross disease and it's called, called microscopic disease. Gross means, oh, you can see it with a microscope. And, and and then it can be a minimal residual disease, which is which you all are familiar with doing a minimal residual testing, right? So there was a study which was done in COG. It was a large study in North America where they gave all these people got chemotherapy for two cycles. Bone marrow was checked after two cycles. Bone marrow is not involved in under microscope. And then they divide this patient into two categories. One where you can check, we can still find um, these, some of these cancer cells under, under MRD testing and some you didn't have any cells. And when you, they, they studied these two groups of patients, they didn't find any outcome difference between the two patients. Both the patients had the same outcome. So in one group, there was MRD, you know, positive. In one day, there was MRD was not positive. And so practically there were no cancer cells in one, there were few cancer cells. So what it was concluded, concluded, concluded that maybe one or two floating cells may either become dead by the time they are given and they may not, uh, and immune surveillance probably will take care of them. So that really doesn't make any difference. But yes, we do not, we do not need to have a gross disease. If you have a gross disease, then you may have potentially, you know, uh, you know, uh, taking a lot of cancer cells along with. So that is, I think I answered your question other way around. Uh, so your question was that do we enrich the stem cells when they are collected? We do not. So we collect the stem cells and we just store them. And the only thing we make to make sure that when we are collecting the stem cells for, for autologous transplant, we collect at least a minimum of minimum cell dose. Okay. And autologous transplants, because they are autologous cells, they engraft faster than allogenic cells. So even a cell dose of 2 to 3 million per kg, 2 to 3 million of stem cells per kg is good enough for engraftment. So if, for example, you're not getting the dose, you're only collected 1 million per kg. So you'll make an attempt to collect one more day or give them some mobilizing agents like Plexifor to mobilize them and collect more stem cells. So you need a particular cell dose and, but, but there's no, there's no enrich, enrichment process or, 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 or expansion process, which is used. However, in, in, in cord blood transplants, there is expansion, which is done. So, as I told you earlier, cord blood is a small pouch of blood, 20-30 ml. It may not have enough stem cells for a bigger child or an adult. So, that will be, was a, you know, one of the rate-limiting factors in cord blood transplants. But nowadays, some groups are doing what we call as ex vivo, you know, expansion. So, they take the cord blood and expand it. And either they, they usually do it before they store the cord blood because then it is easier to expand them before. They expand the cord blood and then store it after their expansion so that we have got enough cell dose for that particular patient who may be, you know, adult or an older you know, child where the weight may not be, the cord blood dose may not be sufficient for that particular weight. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll conclude with one more question. Um, this is the last one. So as a clinician, from uh, a clinician's perspective, how important do you think is the role of genetics for clinicians to treat or to you know, uh, decide on the course of treatment for a, a rare genetic condition, particularly those that involve uh, or that can be cured by bone marrow transplant? Uh, huge. I would say I, I have been uh, in the practice for, I mean, not too long. It's been only 10 years. And I, I have seen a sea change, um, you know, in this field. And I think the the the, the you know the uh, the biggest change which has come in our field probably has been uh, with the with the with the genetic diagnosis available to us now, both in the field of uh, bone marrow transplantation and also in the in the field of general oncology. I mean non hematopoietic I would say non hemat oncology where genetics plays a huge role. In bone marrow transplant world, I think I, I you know I, I mentioned it briefly. If you just take two disease groups, one is immunodeficiency, right? So ten years ago in India, hardly an immunodeficiency would be would be would be would be diagnosed, and if at all will diagnose, and they'll be mainly based on our T and B subsets. Okay, B cells are low; it may be X-linked, you know, uh, A gamma glomerulemia. T cells are low; it's some kind of skid. But we never could able to label them, right? So the labeling of uh, the genetic disease is what has happened with our genetic, uh, you know, uh, uh, facilities now available. That's number one. Number two, that, you know, as I said, one, two lakh children in India are born with immunodeficiencies every year. How much would be reported or how much would be diagnosed would be not even one percent, right? And it still, I think, is probably in that range, one to two percent, because they will be just labeled as um, sepsis. You know, failure to thrive, and they, you really don't know what has happened to the children. Right? I give the example of my case. The previous two children, no one knew what happened to those two children, and third one also had the same problem. So you get family, you know, children, you know, um, uh, pregnancies after pregnancies, children after children, um, you know, getting affected, you know, unfortunately dying and not making it without a diagnosis. So that is slightly that is now changing because people know now know that there are uh, there are avenues available, there are facilities available, and you would make an attempt to. To make a diagnosis you know it may not have helped with that particular child but then it helps in a bigger picture the number three which is it has helped is in our genetic counseling so a lot of children probably uh, you know we have been able to prevent from you know being born because we know at least there was an index child so it does really helps a great deal in these families and uh, uh, you know and and thalassemia is another big, you know, big disease group where where you know have a huge thalassemia burden, and genetics have played a huge role again in preventive strategies, and um, may not too much for the transplant point of view because they are diagnosed phenotypically on hematological parameters, but hugely has contributed in our, uh, in our, you know, uh, in our prevention preventive strategies. The other group of diseases, metabolic and these storage disorders, which I was, you know, which I was alluding to, and uh, you saw how important it is to exactly, uh, you know, label. A particular condition. So you're not going to subject a subject a condition uh, subject a patient to a bone marrow transplant, which is such an expensive, intense treatment, without knowing the exact etiology. You know, all the entities look same. Phenotypically, you can't even differentiate them, right? So they all look same. So even on phenotype, you can't even even think of offering it because you really don't know what you're dealing with. So I think this has really helped us to, you know, um, uh, you know not only diagnose adequately but also uh, you know pro provide treatment and, and and help some of these children who would have otherwise have no other options so huge i would say the contribution has been ex you know that has been the the single most factor uh, which has changed the practice in hematology and transplant in the last uh, probably say 5 to 6 years thank you thank you so much dr sunil so that was a wonderful session with you um, so before there were too many questions but due to paucity of time we can't take all of this but we look forward to having you sometimes in nite uh, if, if situation becomes better and uh, when opportunities arise we'd love to have you here in it and uh, you know uh, look forward to more collaborations and of course we are already now linked to with uh, the consortium at least two conditions that uh, you have uh, sent to us i think we're looking at that uh, thanks to the uh, the people there who connected us, uh, Arti and Bharti. Um, so, uh, before I end, form, formal word of thanks to first of all to our vice chancellor, sir. He was there for, for the entire talk. Uh, I'm sure uh, he would have had something to attend to. Otherwise, he would be around. But I, I'm, I I did see him 
uh, listening to the entire talk. So, um, thanks to our Vice Chancellor, sir, for being so uh, encouraging and supportive of all the activities uh, of the center and also of the research activities of the university. I would also like to thank uh, our, my co founder, Dr. Arti, and uh, our chief executive of the consortium, Dr. Bharti, for being here and for facilitating. Uh, uh, this webinar, uh, thanks to you guys. So we had a wonderful insight into bone marrow uh, transplant uh, techniques and challenges by Dr. Sunil. Uh, and finally, uh, to Dr. Sunil uh, for this uh, wonderful lecture, for taking your time out for from your busy schedule. I understand you are uh, too occupied for uh, you know these kind of sessions, but uh, it uh, I'm sure it was a great uh, uh, you know. Um, contribution to uh, to sharing knowledge about what you know and what we uh, need to know. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you for being a part of the consortium and we look forward to many more collaborative activities with you and with your uh, uh, organization at uh, uh, Narayana Health Center. Uh, I also thank my university officials. Uh, I thank my IT team, uh, Mrs. Savita and uh, Mr. Mahesh for uh, streaming it live on YouTube uh, for helping us with that and also my staff development cell for uh, facilitating the, uh, the webinar and for uh, the feedback and for the registration part. For all the participants who are there on, uh, online, uh, the feedback link has been shared on our YouTube channel. Please fill it up, uh, which uh, will enable you to receive your certificate. And to Dr. Sumil, uh, we can only send you our best wishes and thank you for being a part of this. We will send you a uh, certificate of appreciation site uh, for your uh, uh, wonderful gesture for uh, giving this wonderful lecture uh, as a part of this webinar series of the consortium. Uh, thank you once again, and uh, we look forward to having many more in uh, months to come. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Neban, and thank you, uh, Bharti, Dr. Arti, for this opportunity, and I think it's been great interacting with you. So as you said, hopefully, you know, meet sometime in person and see faces at least. Yes. Uh, it's been it's, it's difficult to be talking in these black screens. I think you all will agree with me. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I think we'll, we'll we'll do that sometime soon. Hopefully things will be better. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you for attending this uh, webinar. Have a good evening. And have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Arti. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you.